The last talk in stage two developer experience segment is from Simon Fosnes, the CTO and co-founder of Digit. Hi, Simon. Hi, very nice How to be here. How are you? Here. Yeah, I'm fine. How about you? Good, good. It looks to be sunny there. So whereabouts are you from? Well, uh, right now I'm located in Stockholm. I'm originally from Norway, so Scandinavia in general. <laughs> All good, all good. Okay, so you're here to talk about docs, code gen, discovery, and governance in a subscribe and a notify world. So, uh, are you ready? Absolutely. Let's yes. go. Cool. Uh, let's have the slides, and here you are. All right. Thank Over you so you. much. Um, I'm very excited to have this talk today. Um, let me first set the scope so that you guys know what to expect from the talk. Um, the title tells uh, a, a little bit about it. So you have discovery, documentation, code generation, and governance. Uh, but where it really differs from um, probably what you're more used to, which is open API and, and more of like a REST world, uh, this is going to focus on the subscribe notify world, um, or it goes by a bunch of other names. I'm going to go into that in the talk. Um, the, the, the scope of this talk is going to be focused mostly as, as a high level introduction. Uh, and so you're going to kind of see the basis for why subscribe notify is going to be something interesting to consider in the first place. Um, and also, it's going to focus on a, a lot of the kind of commonalities and how you can draw uh, draw connections between how currently things are done in, in say, a REST or a re request response uh, API and, and how you can do similar things uh, with subscribe notify. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the first first thing is I, I want to really thank uh, Fran Mendes, who's the founder of uh, Async API, um, just for giving me a chance to speak on behalf of the community. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to do so. And um, um, I, I hope that uh, that the presentation is uh, is up to his standards. And um, um, in, in, in general, uh, probably one of the most valuable things that you can do is to uh, check out the, the Slack channel uh, where you can engage with the rest of the async API community. I've done that myself, uh, sharing ideas and also getting help on certain things that I might be stuck at. And uh, the community is, uh, is absolutely fantastic for, uh, for these kinds of situations um, where you don't really know what to do or you need just some practical help with your specific use case. Um, but the, the first thing uh, to really get clear is, is subscribe notify. Why is it important? And um, wh why is it a pattern that, that is rapidly emerging at, at this point in time? Uh, we kind of have to set the stage for that. Uh, so I'm going to go way back. <laughs> uh, so this here is a, is a timeline of uh, c different communication technologies showing how we communicate, communicate uh, uh, as, as human beings. And it goes back to um, three three thousand BC, where you have the first kind of paper uh, that allowed you to write down um, stuff and thus be able to share it. Um, and uh, throughout history, there's been several uh, advancements that has allowed us to uh, to progress. Um, and it's really communication that facilitates a lot of the things that we kind of take for granted today, such as being able to make a promise about something that's going to happen in the future, or being able to trade between two entities or um, being able to collaborate in a better way. All of those things are fueled by communication. And uh, the rapid uh, rate of innovation that we're seeing today, you can probably attribute a, a big portion of that to more and more sophisticated communication technologies. Um, this is a big topic, and there's a lot of things to cover, um, but I'm not going to go into more details than, say, the printing press was uh, you know, one of the major advancements here where you were able to mass produce written works. Uh, the post uh, system, uh, powered by the uh, postal stamp, um, was able to allow us uh, to uh, you know, communicate over vast distances. Uh, say between two uh, two, dis two distinct people living in, in, in different locations, and uh, it wasn't like a, like a mass medium, but more like a, a point to point connection. Um, then we had a telephone network, which allowed us to to do that just way faster uh, over uh, um, uh, basically over wires and, and electronics. And finally, uh, the advent of the internet through ARPANET 
um, and uh, um, then the uh, progression of uh, communication to, to the mass scale that we see today with so much data being generated and so much communication happening. Um, yeah, so um, there are some uh, commonalities here between uh, uh, this and communication between systems. Obviously, this didn't start until we really had uh, a computer uh, technology at, at a certain level and also the networking. Uh, but ever since um, the internet was kind of in its early, early days, we have been working on ways to improve communication between systems. So uh, communication inside of systems is not really in the scope here, but in really talking about communication between two, say, independently developed systems. Um, and there's a lot of different developments that have happened over the year here as well. I, like going into detail on all of these things would uh, would not really really be that helpful. Um, but it, it's it's really been a big focus of of the industry as a whole, and that's increased uh, more and more um, throughout the years. Um, another pattern that is important to uh, to understand for uh, for uh, seeing kind of why subscribe notify is relevant is uh, system architecture. Um, before we, we uh, like uh, say 20 years ago or, or uh, even, even 10 years ago, some people are still doing it. Um, we were kind of uh, building systems that was all kind of in one big uh, chunk. So uh, most of the communication happened internally uh, in, inside of the system itself. Um, but the trend as we move uh, towards more and more modern systems is that it is split up. Um, there's a lot of reasons why, and there's a lot of books written on this that it's probably a better uh, better reference point for you to to kind of see the see the reason. But what I want you to kind of take away from this is that uh, applications are being split up and they are um, becoming uh, kind of separate entities that are developed independently. And that has a lot of benefits, both in terms of the kind of team dynamics where you see a certain size of the team as uh, certain you know properties for for productivity and so on. Um, and um, yeah, really, the trend is is towards uh, smaller, uh, smaller independently developed uh, systems that then need to communicate together. Um, that's a really important part. And to facilitate that communication, we see now the advent of event-driven architectures, where um, you're using events as a way to communicate. Uh, and th there's a lot of different ways to describe this. There's a lot of different words. Um, yeah, flux, reactive, streaming, message oriented, pub publish, subscribe, CEP, stream processing, uh, event sourcing, fan out. Like there's actors, there's, there's a lot of things, um, but they're kind of. If I were to like boil them down into into one thing, just as as is relevant here for for introduction, where I don't want you to get overwhelmed, um, it would be that they're, they're all kind of talking about a, a way of communicating. Uh, which I'm going to denote as subscribe notify in this presentation specifically. Uh, what what is subscribe notify though? Uh, what does it really mean? Well, basically, it it means that many entities are announcing stuff to many other entities. That that's the way that things are being communicated. Um, so note here that is is many uh, many to many, and uh, the communication happens through announcement. Uh, that is the, the real difference from the more traditional way that we've been doing communication over the HTTP protocol and, and through REST APIs, where one entity asks another entity for something um, or uh, commands something to happen. Uh, so um, the, the big difference is there. Many entities announcing stuff to many other entities. Note there are many to many, and, and uh, request response one entity asks another entity for something. Um, as you noted in, in the previous previous slide, where you saw things splitting into different systems now needing to communicate together, um, subscribe notify is becoming more and more relevant because it is many entities announcing and, and needing to communicate between itself and many other entities, right? Um, so if I were to exemplify this, a request response in the real world would be something like you know a phone call to order pizza. It's not the perfect example, I know, um, but it kind of, Kind of shows it. So you uh, request the pizza, and the, the the service then gives you a response. Um, and then subscribe notify is best exemplified in modern social media. So uh, things like Twitter, Instagram, and stuff like that, um, where you're kind of subscribing to specific people that you're interested in following, 
and uh, you you then get all the notif notifications and uh, all the kind of announcements in your in your feed as as we call it. So this is just one of the prime examples of the subscribe notifying practice. And on the request response side, we have had Open API, and it's been really great for documenting systems uh, and also you know having a machine readable format that has all of these. Uh, great properties when it comes to being able to um, have um, tooling for different aspects of, of um, well, basically a lot of support su supporting tooling can be built when the when the specification is machine readable. And uh, on the other side, um, up until ASIC API, we didn't really have that many things to to do the same uh, for for APIs that are based on the subscribe notify pattern or message-oriented or event-driven, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, but now we do. And uh, that's actually really exciting. Um, it's actually a really, really uh, big deal. At least it was to me when I first discovered that, oh, I can actually build APIs that are you know, just as well documented and has a, a, a similar kind of clarity to the ones that I can, I can build with, with the open API specification. That's, that's really amazing. And I believe also uh, recently, uh, OpenAPI and uh, Async API have both joined kind of the same uh, organization, the Linux Foundation. So um, if you're hesitant about you know, the, the project itself, then that is a really good proof that, that things are going in the right direction when it comes to, to Async API, which is kind of the new kid on the block. Um, but um, yeah, um, so what, what is Async API really uh, quickly described? It's a specification that allows you to create machine-readable definitions for your asynchronous APIs. That's yeah, pretty much it. You can call it asynchronous, event-driven, message-oriented, whatever. Um, it's for those kinds of APIs. And uh, the question then is, how can the async API specification help you build better subscribe notify APIs? How, how can using this uh, help you in your process to kind of uh, deliver a better API experience uh, to your end users. And there's a couple of aspects here uh, that I'd like to, to highlight. Design is a huge one. And uh, for that reason, I've actually decided not to include it in the talk. Um, but yeah, definitely you can reach out on, on, on Slack or anything if you have design specific questions. Um, but that, that's too vast of a topic to, to kind of try to cram down into, into 20 minutes. I, I think that would be a talk in and of itself. Um, discovery, documentation, code generation, and governance is what I'm going to focus on for, for the rest of this. And um, let's start out with uh, discovery. So clear API specifications, as you can define using uh, async API, in this case, for subscribe notify APIs, um, they enable discovery. And what that really means is that the API is available somewhere, and it's easy to find. Um, that can be internally. So for your internal developers, uh, you might want to make it uh, easy to uh, to discover um, by maybe putting it on on some some kind of um, uh, linking to it uh, on on some kind of internal wiki, or if you have uh, some kind of developer hub internally, you can also uh, add it there. Um, making it uh, yeah uh, available and easy to find for for partners and external developers. That's also, like another side of this, where um, you have uh, a couple of catalogs that I've listed down below here. I'm not sure if you can see that really well, but um, you can go to uh, asyncapi.com, and there is a section there. If you if you do a search for for tooling, you'll be able to find these lists. Uh, if you, if you can't really see them clearly on the slides, um, but you have the async API directory by APIs Guru. Uh, which basically is then a directory of asynchronous API specifications um, in, in this format. And then you have API Tracker, which uh, has a subsection focusing on async uh, API specs. And um, there you can also explore a bunch of APIs. Now, discovery can be, be great for you know, publishing your own, your own API, um, but it can also be, be great to have a look at examples of how are other companies structuring their APIs, what kind of conventions are they using, how are they describing various aspects of their, of their uh, payload or, or data models, uh, how are they setting up their endpoints. Uh, getting references for those things 
uh, can really help if you're getting started. And um, that's another kind of use for, for this uh, discovery section is you can actually use it as, as inspiration for your own uh, subscribe notify API. Um, going uh, the further here, um, clear API specifications um, improves documentation. Uh, I think that is made uh, pretty clear, for example, uh, for, for Stripe in the request response um, um, uh, for, for request response APIs, um, you have uh, basically uh, mainly the, the reference documentation is what, I, what I'm referring to here. You have also other aspects of documentation, but they kind of all revolve around um, the reference documentation. Um, and yeah, you can go to, to, to Stripe to, to uh, check out their documentation. I think obviously many of you guys have already seen it. Um, but yeah, documentation is, is mainly about making the API easy to understand and easy to adopt. So the understanding focuses on the theoretical aspect. Do I, do I kind of understand what the core resources uh, mean, what they're talking about here? Um, and adoption is about the practical aspect. Can I do uh, kind of the minimum required work or uh, do I have basically what I need in order to start using this? Um, so it kind of tackles the, the theoretical and practical aspect. And in the center of this is, is your reference uh, documentation. So it, it, it sits at the center. And then revolving around it, you can add additional layers, but it needs to stay consistent with your reference documentation in order for it, for it to kind of be clear uh, to whoever is reading the documentation. So for example, on the understanding front, you can add um, a, a conceptual guides. Um, I think uh, Gatsby JS, which is uh, another like uh, documentation um, that, I, that I really recommend you check out. Um, they, they do a really good job of breaking this down um, where for understanding you have conceptual um, uh, documentation focusing on some of the uh, core concepts in your domain model. Um, and you can describe those in detail using visuals or using uh, you know, uh, analogies and, and, and so on. Uh, and that can really help with a theoretical understanding if something is unclear uh, in the API. On the adoption front, um, you have um, more of uh, uh, the, the kind of additional things that you can add there is how-to guides, uh, which focus on specific use cases and also a quick start to really get started quickly. Um, but okay, let's uh, get back into kind of async API and how it can help out here. Um, you have the async API generator, which allows you uh, to generate literally <laughs> anything. Um, but specifically here, you can generate markdown documentation or um, kind of HTML documentation. Um, so you can take the specification file and you can get an kind of API uh, reference as, uh, as, as an output. Um, you also have a, a React component that you can use uh, just to take in the uh, specification file and then render it if you are using uh, React, for example, for um, some kind of developer portal or something like that, that can be quite useful. Uh, you also have Bump. That's a, a, soft, a software as a service. Um, but it's really, really great uh, for um, documenting Open API and Async APIs side by side. So there you can have actually the request response APIs and the subscribe notify APIs um, kind of available from, from the same same catalog, and uh, you, you can you can use the same kind of setup for both of them. Um, and then you have Withershins, uh, which um, already supports you know Open API, um, but it has all, also added support for for Async API. Uh, I think it's a version one point though, uh, so that might be something to keep in mind. Um, okay, uh, code generation um, is another aspect. Uh, that the clear uh, open it, uh, like clear API specification uh, enables, and it's about making the API easy to implement and integrate. Um, the implementation part is more about your own developers. The integration part is more about external developers, and uh, you can again use Async API Generator to get kind of the implementation part, which can generate things like the server code for you, just like within Open API, Async API provides kind of the same thing. Um, so you can generate server code, but you can also generate uh, tests and, and, and code to test your API. 
Um, so that really helps for kind of internal development. And then for integration, you can generate client libraries that does the necessary logic to call the API, but also has additional uh, functionality um, that allows you to, uh, um, well, uh, yeah, you, you, you can, uh, yeah. So yeah, you have you have the client libraries, and and um, mo most of these things will will be found in the ACK API generator. So I, I highly recommend checking that out. Um, another generator that you have is Node Red Async API uh, plugin. So that's one that um, allows you to generate and configure uh, Node Red nodes. Um, I think that's especially interesting for for people that are into the IoT and smart home. I think that's one of the places where Node Red is used. Uh, quite a lot. Um, um, yeah, I, I see that I'm a little bit low on time, so I'm going to jump to the last slide here. Um, clear API specification also improves governance. And I think this is uh, also a really quite important point that is really hard to get right. So um, governance is really about making it easier to apply rules and manage change. You don't really get a choice uh, of, uh, of governance. There will be a model that emerges if you don't do this intentionally. Uh, that's just how we work as people. Um, you see this also in, in online games, for example, where um, when there is no governance structure, you see the emergence of mobs and uh, you know uh, various ways of, of, of governing that you know, kind of uh, is, is more of an, an emergent form. Um, so it's, it's really important to, to, uh, to try at least to get this right and, and to set the rules clearly up front. And um, um, yeah, um, uh, running running out of time here. But it's, uh, one of the things that you can do in order to uh, apply rules is you can use linting, and uh, linting allows you to um, make sure that the parts of the specification file that are more explicit and that is more explicit um, follows certain rules. Um, and uh, on managing change, since it is a YAML file, you can easily version it. So you can use uh, version control like like uh, Git. Uh, and, and connect that to GitHub and make sure that you uh, uh, see what kind of changes are being made through some sort of pull request setup or, or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, you'll you'll find more details on asyncapi.com. So <laughs> just go there. Uh, it's probably probably also clear in terms of the the tooling. Uh, but there is a lot of these these things are already covered by Async API. Uh, also, again, if you uh, if you, if you want more of an elaborate uh, uh, kind of description or, or more practical guidance, asyncapi.slack.com is probably the, the place to go. That, that's the perfect place to inter interact with the community. And with that, I'll uh, uh, wrap it up basically here. Thanks, Simon. Uh, one question just from the chat. So. Uh, how to document a mixture of synchronous and asynchronous APIs? Do we use Open API, Async API, or yeah. both? Yeah, so Open API and Async API, uh, the cool thing about them is that you can reuse, for example, data models in between them. So uh, they are compatible. And they're also now being managed under the same organization, the, the Linux Fund Foundation. So um, there's not too many tools that integrates both of them yet. But as I mentioned in the presentation, there is one called Bump. And you can check that out. Bump allows you then to uh, to have those kinds of documentation side by side. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, one, one of the things, if, if you if you structure your, your APIs to be composable so that you have the models um, in, in separate files that are then composed into, say, for example, an open API specification, you can easily then compose it as well into an Async API specification, which allows you then to define your domain model once and reuse it across both of those scenarios. And th these are just different ways of communicating, and they might be useful for, for certain contexts. So um, to me, that, that's, that's really something that I think is a great reason to use Async API. It's so seamless to transition between that and Open API. That's wonderful. Cool. Thank you very much for taking time to present your talk, Simon. Uh, appreciate it. Likewise. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. And have a good day. Bye.